The topic of our presentation today is valuing old, existing, or historic library buildings. And we're going to review some ways to get the most from these meaningful resources. My name is Val Shute, and I'm an architect that's been practicing for more than 45 years based in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I am joined with Jessica Bergen and Emily Kornack, who are library directors and will introduce themselves as they share their ideas during the presentation. I am the founding principal of River Architects, which opened in 1981. My work includes a wide range of building types and sizes with direct experience with public uh, and academic libraries, as well as historic preservation projects. My intention in my part of the presentation is to leverage this experience and with my co-presenters, director-focused perspectives, guide you in unlocking the potential of your existing building, whether it be historic or just slightly used. Where do we begin? Well, there is a, there is a real difference in starting with an existing resources or an existing resource versus building new. The starting points offer different perspectives. The new building path is present and future focused, uh, while that existing building has a past and a present that will influence the future. My suggestion is to think of your existing building as a story and use its past to help tell the story. This background information will become the foundation for the future, the future chapters of your story. Finding the building's past, setting the theme for your building story is a challenging endeavor and can be elusive at times. Just when you feel that you've uncovered everything that there is to tell, something new seems to pop up. My advice here is to dig deeper, uh, but to ex is not only to dig deeper, but to also expand the size of your dig by thinking outside that box. Try and gather all of the facts and dates that you can and push the envelope by asking why and what else was going on at time to broaden your research. We had a, a, a project where, as we did this, uh, people were forgetting about the lumber industry that was going on when this building was built and their, their historic library. And it influenced the material selections that they made, the type of wood, and they decided to renew that in this, in this present way of doing it. So it's again, it's not just the building, think of the things that are also going on. Um, um, ideally, what, what I ask people to do is go to know the situational and the aspirational evidence that helps to add to the, the hard facts that you're gathering. So much of this work is done in a historic context where you're trying to figure out who, when was it built? Who built it? Why'd they pick that location? But there is a whole bunch of other stuff that's sort of under the table that may not seem important, but I, I guarantee you it will be something that you may want to use and, and to be mindful of that. The goal, in my mind, is to find out absolutely everything that you can understand. It may not be, may not seem important at the time, but gather it and keep it in your treasure chest. Appreciate and evaluate that building for its future use in your library expansion project. This is a um, uh, a very important part of all of these aspects of this. So that's the building's past. Now, I'm going to try and sort of unravel this plot a little bit and have the storyline shift to the present. Boy, my suggestion here is to develop a timeline uh, of the building's past and present with room for its future to be added. Um, I like timelines because you can actually build a timeline and actually do the library on the top and of all of its important dates but then tie it in below to what was going into your, into your community, your city, your, in, in the state, in, in the Midwest, in the United States, in the world. And it's sometimes there's some interesting things that weave into this that make it more interesting. 
The focus is always still, as you're developing this timeline, is it's going to be evidence-based. But it, at some point, it may shift to more systems details in lieu of the building's roofs. And, and we'll talk about this, and you'll get a better idea of what I mean by systems. These systems include the building envelope, the structure, the mechanical and electrical components, and any maintenance records that you can find. Items like when the roof was replaced, if the boiler or furnaces were redone, was the building tuck pointed, or any details like this are always helpful and will help as a project progresses. Knowing when and what was added will help the design and construction team evaluate them moving forward. Um, the last bullet here is sort of establish an evidence trail um, that that whole idea of where so you can go back and see how some of the what some of these decisions were based on. The next part of this is discovering the future. Um, I, I sub characterize this as how to tell the story. And boy, in this, uh, I try to distill this down to the, the basic. Um, I had more information at this point, but it got too uh, verbose. So in, in the discovering the future, the goal here is to introduce how important the existing building is in the development of your project story. Um, this image is intended to show how this past and present can be interpreted to tell that story. Um, these two boxes here of opportunities and challenges, um, these are here to sort of help you evaluate the existing building's adapt adaptability to be renovated or added on to. This idea of whether opportunities glass half full or the challenges glass half empty. Um, and you can see the four, five bullet points I put under each one. Um, here's a case where I have multiple experiences of this. Some I've only had done with one building, see it from through one set of lens or through one lens. Uh, but sometimes that starting point is a good one, and sometimes it is a dead end, and it can be very challenging. Sometimes that past and the present can be blended. Other times that past makes it extremely challenging for the future building, the future library, and that used to, to move on. So we have this positive inherited conditions and negative, um, definitely uh, sort of at, at odds with one another. The goal the, for this to end up is where the, the intervention the addition or the renovation work, it balances with that. It gets a little tougher when these two are always in constant tension with one another and they really don't, dis and they disagree. Um, and, all, and, and ideally, intervention wants to move the needle so it excites and, 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 um, and embraces the community and they feel part of it. And, Sometimes that path becomes burdensome, and we you have to really be careful how how to do that. Sometimes this storyline is crystal clear, and it works or it doesn't work. But I will tell you that in some of them have an uncertain path that seems to be going down one way in the beginning, and then detours, and just when you think it's going to stay detoured, it it's, it cycles back. To, to the path that you were on. So um, takes a little bit of patience at times, but to know that sometimes it isn't a straight line journey that we have here. And, and this idea of assessing whether that glass is half full or half empty is an important part of what's going on. Goal here, search for that. The word I'm using for addition here is intervention looking for that ideal intervention that links that past, the present, and the future. I'm gonna ask you to think aspirationally, and, but ground yourself in reality. Those things are kind of intention at times, but flexing them and, and, and stretching them, I think will ultimately help inspire your users. Um, your tireless and imaginative efforts to document your resources past and present 
as we talked about earlier, I think will help put you in a good position to bring your library story to a, a, a very memorable ending moving forward. Uh, in my career, I have, yeah, I, I have a, a number of libraries and um, the three of us are going to sort of present a boots on the ground experience with library projects that involve old existing and historic library buildings that we're going to share. My lessons came from the, the over 25 libraries that I've worked on in, in three states, mostly Wisconsin. But for this, I have chosen to sort of deliberately focus on big picture items that impact the overall project development process and sort of have refrained from the details. Um, when you get, uh, um, uh, Emily and Jessica are going to focus on their projects, and I think that's going to drill in and, and get, let you see something with that lens up close, sort of. I'm going to take more of a macro approach while they're doing more focused micro. The first one needs to be resourceful. Um, there was this resourcefulness in my mind is a really critical ingredient in, in, your, in your process here. Um, I almost think of it as an attitude. That, that you want to keep. It, it, it's a strong one and it influences everything that's going on. These challenges, um, you really want to be thinking of those of turning those into opportunities. That's my turning liabilities into assets. Some people call resourcefulness, creativity, imagination. I still like the resourcefulness word. It's sort of grounded in a pr pragmatic instead of just a, a creative side. It's it actually sort of, in my head anyway, it balances those things. So this resourcefulness, in my mind, is a very important ingredient in what's going on. The next one, leveraging the past as a unique starting point. Um, I, In my mind, this is your inspiration for moving forward. With what you've learned, even if it's a, a challenge, I think there's a way to harness it and again, flip it and make it an opportunity. Um, but I, I do think to do it, you have to go in embracing everything you know about it so that you don't have to go backwards. You want to keep moving forward with this idea as you do this. Boy, the, the next one of pre-ADA buildings require accessibility, ingenuity. Yeah, there, there was a time that my career spans it that buildings were unsympathetic, and there's, we still are, but we're, we're guided by codes now, to people with physical challenges. And I'm using the word physical challenges instead of handicap um, purposefully. And we need to address that issue. Um, this, this idea will sort of go through the project. A lot of these buildings at this time were built higher out of the ground, doors are narrower, it was a different mindset on building that resource. Um, so an important piece, keep it in mind moving forward. There's another one here that's this idea of the different strategies of when you do your building. There are different words to describe this that, that stretch from mild to strenuous work on your project. And, and Strenuous being more the, the, the very purposeful, um, focused restoration versus the ideas of re rehabilitation versus preservation. Let's take the first one, rehabilitation. In that case, we're acknowledging the need to alter or to add to an historic structure to help it meet continuing or changing needs while retaining its historic character. So there's a little bit, there's flexibility with this. It's still holding the course, but there's a little more, um, I'll use the word wiggle room carefully here, uh, but there's a little more room for interpret interpretation. Preservation, on the other hand, focuses on the maintenance and repair of existing historic buildings and the retention of the building's form as it evolved over time. Um, so in this particular case, it is, it could be as simple as maintenance and repair, but it is really focusing on the historical side of it. 
whereas the, the strenuous one, uh, depending on its condition, is the restoration, where it depicts a property at a particular period of time in its history and restores it to that time. So in that case, if that period of significance is one that there's an addition that's been added on that doesn't comply with that earlier, or it's an older one, but there's two older ones, depending on that period of significance, you will have to at some point make that determination. So this idea of mild to strenuous, those are decisions that you will make and, and your committee and your community as to how to embrace that building and, and how to deal with it moving forward. Uh, the next one in heritage conditions can be um, opportunities or challenges. Um, I think we we kind of um, yeah you know, we kind of addressed this one earlier, and I, I won't belabor that. Um, but but this one is again one that very carefully sets the course for what you're doing. Um, this idea of thoroughly evaluating the building code when building old or new, this is a, this effort, I can't speak highly enough that this should be done early in the design process and constantly monitored throughout the project development timeline. And it's gotta be done extremely early. Even if you don't know everything you're gonna know about your addition it, or your intervention, it may help you understand it better. The idea of doing this later when the plans are sent in for review, it's, it's too late in the process. You want to do it earlier and have it guide your decisions as you go through. So it's a very important part of this and one that a lot of times is done later and thought that uh, whatever, whatever they'll find, we can fix. Sometimes it's not quite that easy to do that. Um, let me see. The integration of a structural mechanical and electrical systems can be challenging. Oh boy, this one is one that also ties with the code to me. This needs to be done early. This is a very important one. And it's one that some think of it as we'll do the design and then we'll fit this stuff in. I, my feeling is that architecture and engineering teams will be sitting at the table with you in the beginning collaborating on this nonstop throughout the project. It isn't always done that way. The reuse of an existing building being sustainable, that is your best way to be sustainable. You're, you're re-invoking an existing resource and you're not using a bunch of energy to create a new one. This is one of the, the best ways to do this. So if you can do it, you are on a very sustainable path. And then finally, um, build consensus. This idea of involving a number of voices in a decision can be challenging, but not including them will be even more disappointing. And in my opinion, it's not the number of voices, it's how you do it. My preference is consensus versus majority rules, and it gives a, a way of not a winner and a loser, but everybody moving forward, embracing an idea, maybe not totally agreeing with it, but letting it advance to continue to evolve and, and, and come together. Uh, I am now going to pass the baton and let Emily move into her sharing her ideas of these lessons learned, and, and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you, Val. Well, let me just work on sharing my screen here. Okay. So my name, oops, let me back up here. If I can, here we go. My name is Emily Kornack and I am the director of the Lake Geneva Public Library in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Um, we com recently completed a building renovation, uh, not an expansion, just a renovation. Um, and this, this presentation and these slides will give a few examples of some of the things that we learned and some of them overlap quite a bit with Val's lessons learned. So I think you can hopefully we'll be able to see a few concrete examples here. 
So a little bit about our library. We are a prairie style building. It is a historical building, but not on the National Register of Historical Places. So it's just a, a local treasure. It's very beloved by our community and our visitors. Lake Geneva has a lot of tourism, um, especially in the summer, but also all year round. So this building, which was built in 1954, gets a lot of attention because it looks like a Frank Lloyd Wright building. And it was designed by an architect who was a protege of his, um, James R. Dresser. Um, I mentioned it was built in 1954. There were a couple very small additions to the building in the 60s and 70s, but nothing major. Um, and over the past few decades, nothing really had been done to the inside as the library services and collections grew. They just kind of got crammed in. Um, Repairs were sort of done piecemeal. Um, we're set right on the shore of Geneva Lake, just uh, in downtown Lake Geneva. So we've got this gorgeous location. Um, and I, I remember years ago walking by here before I worked here. I started here in 2017 and thinking, oh, I want to go in because it looks, it's got to be stunning. And I came inside and I was really disappointed because it was very crowded and very dark um, and really cluttered and it smelled bad. So, um, we had a we had a lot of work to do, and uh, we knew that coming into this. So there we go. So here's a here's some before and after pictures. This is kind of that that dark um, atmosphere. We've got lakeside windows all along this the the um, one lake facing side of our building, but those were partially taken up by staff workspaces and also just kind of crowded. Um, and this is an after shot where we uh, redid our shelving, lowered it, um, expanded our youth area, and um, made all of our lakeside windows, again, available for public use and public space, which also let a lot more light into this building. Well, a little background about our project. It was a, approximately a $1.3 million project from start to finish. Um, we had initially been talking about expansion um, and then COVID happened. So we did a quick pivot um, as we were figuring things out um, in the early days of the pandemic. And we realized that we wouldn't have city capital funds available for an expansion like we were thinking. Um, we also have access challenges due to our location downtown. We've got um, no parking other than street paid parking. Um, so expansion was always gonna be challenging anyway with just the limited um, accessibility accessibility to our building um, and parking is a big part of that. Um, so we looked at our, our endowments and uh, reserves that we had on hand and we did not do a fundraising fe feasibility study, but we had a fundraising consultant. Um, and our goal with our consultants that we set was to raise $500,000 um, in about six months. And we raised over $830,000 in that time. So, so that worked out pretty well. Um, for us and allowed us to address some of the issues that you will see in these slides of um, like these fluorescent box fixtures that were probably put on the ceiling sometime in the 80s that were making a low ceiling already lower and just that cluttered crowded feeling that we could start looking at um, some ways to optimize our collections and our layout to to make it seem less less crowded and more user friendly and that's kind of the result of of that. So some of the things that we did get re, uh, resolved with our project were um, flooring. We had all kinds of different carpeting that was uh, full of holes and tearing, um, delaminating, that we got fixed. Um, and it's amazing what consistent new carpeting will, uh, the difference that it will make throughout a building. Um, we, we had updated our furniture. And again, I've, I've mentioned the layout. We lowered shelving and we actually reoriented it the way that James Dresser, the architect, had originally planned, uh, which allowed um, us seeing through the building from Main Street all the way to the lake. So that emphasis on sort of restoration um, was a big part of sort of public acceptance of this project. Um, we had uh, some ventilation and HVAC issues that were, were mostly fixed. Um, I mentioned our windows being accessible to the public again. Um, we looked at mobile shelving units and, and have those in as, in as many spaces as possible. That just gives us more flexibility to do things within our, our library space outside of the, the one program room we have. 
Um, and we updated our staff workspace. So all of those things together, this really made a big difference when we hadn't done those in a long time. So again, kind of just the, hopefully you can get a sense of sort of what this library was like before and a little bit of what it was like after. So the stained glass panels um, play on Lake Geneva history a little bit. They are a Frank Lloyd Wright design um, was used in the Geneva Hotel um, that was here downtown, just a little bit further past these windows, um, but it was torn down in, I think, 1970. So we, we do have one of the original hotel windows with this design, and we brought this design back with a local stained glass artist in these um, panels. Um, I've got a list of some of the, the challenges that we had throughout this project. Um, a lot of these were re resolved, and some of them are just sort of kind of flow over into lessons learned for us. But this this building is was and is very beloved by this community. So um, there were a lot of people worried about like what are you going to do to it. So again, emphasizing um, usability and also restoration was was important. Um, and we also had to. We are a municipal library funded by the city of Lake Geneva, and libraries because they can operate semi-autonomously. Um, we hadn't had a lot of very close collaboration with the with our municipality um, in terms of capital funding. So that was a learning curve for us. Like, what capital funds are available? How would they, that work? Um, what can we do, and in, in what kind of time frame? So another piece of n renovating for us and not expanding was realizing that you know we could tap into tap into city capital funds for an expansion potentially, no guarantee though, and it would probably be several years out in the future, and we need to do something a lot more quickly. Um, we we did still have some challenges with um, some of the contractors and subcontractors and on their work after. Uh, the project was actually completed. So there was some ongoing troubleshooting of, of ventilation. Um, it's it's not always easy to get hold of contractors and subcontractors when they're when they're technically done with your project. So that's another another challenge that can come up and require some persistence on on the part of library staff. Um, there are still other things like signage and, and lighting. There were components to this project that that we had left out intentionally just because of, of budgeting. And we thought, you know, if, if we have the funds, we'll come back and do them. So we did do, we are doing some add-on projects and after the fact projects um, just because we we, we realized um, that we could do that later. Um, and Val mentioned the the maintenance records of your of your building. We didn't, we did not have a lot of those. So we did have a lot of library history about the building and 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 things like board meetings and minutes, but we didn't have a lot of information about what kind of systems um, and what kind of maintenance had really been going on here. So a lot of it um, we kind of found out as we went along. Here's another before shot. Um, this is along our main street side, and this this section here we turned into a public computer area. So that that turned out pretty nicely. Um, and just a couple notes on lessons learned from our project. Um, the one thing I've, I've, I tell people who are starting building projects is, is talk to your police department or security service or emergency management prior to doing a renovation or an expansion, just because um, we found out after the fact that security is a very real issue. We're in a, we're in a small town and, and a fairly safe town too, but, but it, it's always good to plan for security and access control. Um, and that's something we we work closely with our police department about, but um, I think they would have appreciated being involved with this project from an earlier point on versus when we did bring them in, which was after everything was done. Um, I have a couple notes about just making your, sure that your contacts are in place just so that you can troubleshoot things afterwards. Um, we did find out too that from some of our mobility challenged patrons that Although our updates were ADA compliant, that's not always enough, and that's not always the most user-friendly or accessible um, requirement for them. So an example would be just putting automatic door openers on any doors that, that people need to get through. 
um, just because those aren't always ADA mandated, but they, they can make a big difference for people. And my, my final note here too, is to have a healthy contingency budget in place for anything, anything unexpected. So for us, one of those things was asbestos mitigation. We found out we had asbestos in the ceiling um, and quite a, they had sprayed some asbestos um, probably back in the 50s um, in the ceiling that, that limited our ability to do any construction work to those, ceiling, um, those ceilings unless we uh, mitigated asbestos. And that turns out to be a very expensive and time consuming process. So that was a, a lesson that we found out. That's pretty much it for me. I just have a couple more before pictures. You had, I showed a, a picture of our new computer area before, and this is where it was prior to renovating. It was sort of crammed in a back little hole in the wall, which is now actually restrooms. Um, and this just kind of gives you a sense of everything being kind of crowded again. And after, I, I feel like we did succeed in opening up quite a bit of space, even though we didn't expand. Um, this is our staff workroom, which we we did too, just to make that a little more user friendly for staff. Um, and we added two meeting rooms just for quiet space because we did not have those before. And Prairie style open floor plan means sound carries here. So, and just some of the the furniture that we updated. That table hexagon table in the middle there is a an original James Dresser piece. So we did keep some of the the historical and legacy pieces too. Um, and that's that's really it from me. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime by phone or email when I'm available. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'm Jessica Bergen. I'm at the Carnegie Shoddy Memorial Public Library in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And I'm going to share my screen and tell you a little bit about our project. Okay, so um, our project started, um, I would say in earnest in 2021, and we're actually still, um, still working through it. So I'll give you some updates as we go along here. Um, the background of our library, um, our library is one of the original Carnegie libraries. Um, that were built all around the country um, at the turn of the century. Ours was built in 1903. Um, so you can see on the left, they um, either at 1903 or very close to it. And then on the right is a um, recent photograph. We did have a significant addition in 1982, which is sort of towards the back of the building um, from where you're looking now. Um, some interior shots. Um, I, I enjoyed trying to put together this before and after from the exact same vantage point. But the um, photo on the left is, of course, from the early 1900s. Um, and then the one on the right is from 2018. So just before we started our project. Um, you can see a lot of things have been preserved from the original building, but um, some things that have been changed as well along the way. Um, here's another, another one of those. This is um, one of the reading rooms, you can see the fireplace on the left, um, all the beautiful woodwork. Um, and I would, if you would take note of the uh, lighting fixtures on the left from the early 1900s, I'm going to refer to those a little bit later. Um, those were gas light fixtures um, primarily, and then some of them were gas and electric together. So as I said, this project began in earnest in um, 2019. However, it really was decades in the making as many of these types of projects are. Um, so the first space needs analysis was done in 2001. Um, along the way, there were lots of committees, there were plans made, there were feas a feasibility study was in 2019. Um, project revisions, capital campaign planning through 2015. Um, and then 2017 is sort of when things got got serious about starting up building again. Um, and I came on board in 2018. Um, 
so 2018 the the city had which is our municipality had agreed um, to a 2021 construction date for our project um, so we hired our um, our architects and designers um, to start putting a design together um, once that not too long after that um, the city changed their capital improvement plan and moved the library project back to 2028. Um, so as far as challenges and opportunities go, that was one of our first challenges, um, simply because we had already um, spent quite a lot of money that the library board had raised on um, hiring the architects, getting the schematic design going. So um, we launched um, a campaign that we called Get Loud for the Library. Um, to try to get the city to um, move our project back up to 2021 where it was originally scheduled. Um, it was it was a hard time. Um, it was it was hard to to work through that, but the silver lining there is that we had an enormous amount of public support. Um, the bottom picture you can see, um, at a city council meeting, we packed the council chambers with library supporters. Some of them are wearing their Get Loud for the Library t-shirts. Um, and so through that, and then also um, by kind of sweetening the deal, we, we raised some additional funds um, that we had originally thought the city was going to put in. Um, so we kind of reduced their their monetary share of the um, of the project by by raising more money. So. Um, in that 2019 fall, we um, got a two and a half million dollar donation from the Shoddy family, um, which you may be able to tell now from the name of our library, which is the Carnegie Shoddy Memorial Public Library. Um, prior to that donation, we were the Barrett Public Library. So um, the next step, we got city approval. We had our funding, so we needed to um, get approval from the state historical preservation office because our building um, was on is on the historical register so we started that in 2020 which as you know things got um, a little complicated in 2020 so we did get slowed down a little bit um, but just to share a little bit about the planning that we did um, you know as val said looking at our at our present and our future sort of what do we have now and what did we want to do in this project um, so these were some of the the needs that we wanted um, overall it was really uh, a lot about needing more space additional space um, both for public and for staff workspaces so you can see it in the proposal um, for study rooms and meeting rooms um, we went from 1500 square feet to 4200 square feet um, our for adult collections and seating areas almost 4000 feet to 8000 feet and then staff workspace we had about 900 square feet and um, at the end of this project we're hoping for about 2600 square feet um, the considerations we had to think about was well the first decision we had to make was are we going to continue to use the original carnegie building um, and if so how will we go about that um, th the public input was very much so that they wanted to keep this original building um, and then add on to it um, not only because the, the building itself is is well loved, but it's it's right off the square of our historic downtown and is a really, really one of the kind of anchor buildings to that area. And it's a great location. Um, so I, we knew we couldn't do any better location wise. Uh, of course, a building built in 1903 did not take into account many accessibility issues, um, so that was very high on our list for considerations of what we wanted to do in this project. So this was the initial design um, that we submitted uh, that was created based on those considerations that um, I just showed you, and this is what we sent to the State Historic Preservation Office for approval. Um, we submitted that design at the end of 2019. Um, so you can see the original Carnegie building on the left with um, 
the kind of orangish roof and then on the right a new addition um, where we propose to put that addition um, is on property the library had purchased about 10 years ago that had a um, like office building on it so part of the project was to um, to demolish that office building um, which we had been renting out and actually um, making some money on which was great for our building project and then um, build an addition to the east of our building. So we sent this to uh, who we officially called SHPO, State Historical Preservation Office. Um, they were not, I would say not great fans of our initial design. Um, they had quite quite a few concerns. Um, I, I, wrote, I wrote on here what some of their concerns were. Um, but they were concerned about the height and the closeness of the addition to the street blocking the view of the Carnegie from the main historic square. Um, and then also they had some concerns about some of the parts of the 1980s addition. They wanted it to be very clear which part of the building, it was the original um, 1903 portion of the building, and then what is the new, you know, 2023 part of the building. So they wanted it to really almost look like two buildings um, side by side so that the Carnegie was still very distinct. They did, of course, want us to preserve the original wood trim and casework um, artwork. There's a, a nice frieze that was put in early on and some of those things, which we um, intended to preserve many of those things anyhow. So we were happy to do that. But um, they did one of the ideas that our architect had that um, the preservation office actually really liked was um, to get replica historic light fixtures and try to um, try to do a restoration of those original reading rooms to look more like they did originally and not partially what they looked like originally and then also with 1980s fixtures in it. So um, we were very happy to do that as well. There were some landscaping concerns. There were quite a bit of um, cement benches and things planters put in in the 80s that they suggested removal of. And then finally, they uh, want us to be sure to have some kind of installation or storyboard of the history of the library and have that on display. Um, so finally, with that approval, it took about a year to get that approval um, through the Historic Preservation Office. Um, we had we had heard that sometimes it would be six to eight weeks or maybe a few months. Um, our experience was quite a bit longer to get that approval, though part of that, of course, was because it was in 2020 um, and 2021 when things were still kind of moving slow um, with COVID. So we had our groundbreaking last April. Um, so just a few shots of that. Uh, I, I just had to put this slide in for a chuckle because I think we spent half of the groundbreaking ceremony taking pictures with shovels, different groups of people together, because everyone was so excited and really wanted to be um, in one of the, the groundbreaking pictures. So we did quite a few of those, um, and it, it was a good time, though it was quite cold that day. Um, so some early pictures here, um, demolition of the office building next door um, was was quite a sight um, and quite noisy, but it kind of gives you an idea um, what the east side of that building of the Carnegie building looks like where we're going to um, put the addition on. Um, so our plan was to do the addition first, move into the addition and then um, remodel the Carnegie. But uh, one note as far as um, getting a lot of community support and engagement and making sure we had buy-in was we we had to very much consider our neighbors on our block so without the um, office building our block now consists of three historic buildings the library um, a methodist church and then um, one of the ringling family mansions that is now an inn and brewery so we wanted to be sure that our design and our plans were honoring those historic buildings as well as our own historic buildings. Um, so you can kind of see in the the diagram on the left there, um, we worked with the neighbors to come up with a parking plan for the whole block. Um, 
make some improvements to how the alley was functioning um, as a way to get to some of those parking areas. But we really wanted to be sure to include our neighbors early on, um, in part because we knew there would be some days that our project was going to be very obnoxious to, to be next to, um, certainly very noisy, dusty, dirty, um, though they have been great neighbors and been really patient with us so far. Um, this is some demolition uh, pictures, kind of where we're starting to take the Carnegie apart on the east side. Um, on the bottom photo where the sort of yellow um, insulation is, that was the temporary wall that we put in in the Carnegie. Um, we were open throughout this part of the project. Um, so actually my, my office is where that yellow insulation used to be. So I, I moved to a temporary office space. Um, and we had this big temporary wall in the building. Um, during this time, this is really when we started getting rolling and having lots and lots of meetings um, to discuss the project and work out details. So I included a fun office picture there from one of our OAC meetings, which is the owner architect contractor meeting. Um, the new addition, once, once we finally got there, really went up quickly. Um, it's about 16,000 square feet. Um, it's two levels. The picture on the left at the bottom is the library staff um, getting a tour early on. It was super cold that day, but we didn't care because we wanted to get in and walk around um, the new part of our building. Um, and then recently, last month, um, the addition was completed um, and so we started the moving process. We did close um, for four weeks for moving. Um, we did not hire movers. We um, elected to do it ourselves and save quite a bit of money on that process. So in the photos here you can see we rented um, 80 something of these wood book carts and um, had quite a few great volunteers and staff that came in. Um, some of the city public work staff came. So it was it was really hard work, but it was actually kind of fun because um, we had so many people helping and we all got to um, enjoy that work together. Then I wanted to give some uh, pictures of the, the completed new addition. Um, the left is the before of our children's library area, um, which was in the basement of the Carnegie. Um, very little natural light, um, low ceilings, very crowded. Um, and then on the right side, the, the two right pictures are the new children's library, which is on the second floor of our new addition, um, which we just opened last week. So uh, we have had many people um, through the building already the first week we're open um, and everyone just is gaga about this this new children's library which which we are too we're very happy with it we're finally glad to have the kids out of the basement and in a nice space um, the other major part of our new addition was our new teen space um, you can see on the left what we were working with and it was really a corner sort of just carved out of the um, children's library area. Um, now the teens have their own space that's it's not connected to the children's area, it's not connected to the adult area, it's really their own. Um, and we've had a lot of great feedback about that space as well so far. Um, at this point we have just finished um, with the, the addition and now we're starting on the renovation which is supposed to be done in October so maybe I'll get a chance to show you guys the rest of that when we're finished. Um, Val uh, I'll pass it back to you to wrap up. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the presentation team, we'd like to express our appreciation for this opportunity to share our thoughts on helping you value your old, existing, and or historic library building. Our contact information is included on that title slide that we started with, and you can reach out and to see if we can help you to start your library story. Thank you and good luck.